in today's video, we're going to get a crop update, and then we're going to take a look at the alfalfa and corn debacle field. Then we're going to take the mancy and a scraper, and we're going to work on making the subgrade for the new shop project. All right, guys. Hey, thanks for joining me. John Stevens, Maple Grove Farm. All right, quick crop update, and then we'll get to the alfalfa cornfield debacle update. Um, since Father's Day, we were super dry until uh, about a week ago or so, and then we got an inch of rain. And then now here just the other night, we got another inch, and then um, in between Father's Day, in, or in between the other week and this, one inch of vents. We've had a couple dust settlers, you know, a tenth here, a, a couple tenths there. And and we've had a couple tenths since that inch. And so it's starting to look, if we stay in this pattern, just we get just a few more uh, inches of rain here or there. And we, we have the potential that some, if we look, if you drive around the territory and look at field by field, because this year you really get to see um, you know, this field here looks phenomenal and you only have to go a across the road or a half mile down the road and that field you're like, oof. And so there's some fields that could do average or slightly better than average and there's going to be some fields that are, are far enough gone in spots in them fields that they're going to have a tough time on some of them fields. But um, soybeans are made in August for us. Uh, as long as they're alive going into August, we get rain in August, we could still pull out good bean crops. And so if with the heat coming, if we just started getting inches and inches and inches of water, we could have a fantastic bean crop. Uh, the corn, uh, we made it through pollination. I, I am I am so happy. Uh, going into pollination, the forecast was 95s and 100 degree days for a week and with zero humidity, zero overnight night relief. And I thought, pollination's done. After pollination, we're going to have 30 to 50% success of pollination. With the forecast that was there, we're done. And then the smoke come in from Canada. We had some of the overnights were in the 40s. Some of the day, we had a couple days where it was hard to get much over 70. You're like, nice, nice, cloudy and 70. Whew, give that pollen and, and let them plants just kind of breathe for a, a, some relief. And then we got that inch of rain and you're just like, whoo, okay. And you can see the crops almost respond instantly to that rain. Then we got a, a random couple tents here and there. And then we got that other inch the other day. We're, we're setting up that the, the ear development on the corn looks really good. Beautiful cobs, nice straight rows, really good looking pollination. There, there, it, there might be some bad spots of pollination, but, but the, the, the spots that I checked, it, it looks pretty good so far. Um, and as, as the cob develops, maybe it will show a little more. Uh, pollination damage, we're not sure, but let's stay optimistic here. Um, and now with this rain, we might actually end up with it. We're going to have something for a second cutting on the Lumberg farm. I drilled in some sorghum, a summer mix of sorghum sedan, millet, sunflowers, vetch, uh, cow peas, and a few other grasses on, on the Schoberg farm. That 30 acre, I call it a 40, but I mapped it as a 30. Um, that 30 acre parcel there on the Schoberg farm and that's been laying in the ground we're coming on a week and a half now and I haven't seen anything germinate yet because behind that inch a week and a half ago the next day I scratched the dirt and the top half inch was so dry that I thought I don't know if it's worth my time but I had to do it I had to do it because if you did it then when would you now we've got some moisture so maybe now that field will get going and I got another little seven acre that I seeded down this spring and I think it all died. Uh, most of what I put out there I, I think died because other than the little alfalfa, there was a splash of alfalfa and you could see a touch of alfalfa around the field. But uh, 
the air, all the grasses, I think, them little seeds, I think it was, there was enough moisture from the germinate early on, but there, I don't think there was enough moisture to sustain their life, and, and they're gone. It's just a weed field with some scattered alfalfa. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some of that summer mix and, and put some alfalfa in it and, uh, and, and run up there and drill that field and see if we can't get something going up there for this year. Uh, now the corn and alfalfa debacle. So if you guys remember, <clears throat> I thought in April when the alfalfa was little, I could just do a quick burn down. Hold on one second. <sighs> There's a massive spider, massive spider climbing on the camera. I'm surprised at the size of that thing. I'm surprised it didn't tip the camera over. But um, if you guys recall, very early April, we had a lot of heat and the alfalfa was tiny, just coming out of dormancy, you know, just greening up. And so I thought, well, perfect time to hit it with some Roundup. I hit it with some Roundup and then it turned super cold. <laughs> like crap on a cracker. I already planted it right behind the burn down, thinking, you know, day by day you're gonna watch that little alfalfa die and the corn come up and nope uh, it turned cold so that really delayed the germination and emergence of the corn and the alfalfa just grew like alfalfa likes to grow end of may you had a full stand of alfalfa out here and so uh, we burnt it down again and you could see the alfalfa go from green, you know, fade to yellow, fade to brown. And you could see the corn starting to come up through. And you're just like, yes. And then um, as the corn's growing, you could see the alfalfa fade from brown to yellow to green to uh, back to a full crop of alfalfa. And you're like, no. <laughs> Had we had normal rain this year, I think the corn would have done really good because that corn coming through the alfalfa was about as green as any corn you could find around here, but just with the alfalfa sucking the water out of the field, you could see that corn just roped up and was being choked out on water. Plain and simple, water was the determining factor for that kind of mistake this year. Um, but we did learn that living alfalfa, it's not the alfalfa that's doing the nitrogen, it's the soil life. And so we learned that the soil life will share the nitrogen with the corn, just like it gives the alfalfa. So living alfalfa can give off nitrogen credits to a companion crop. We just have to figure out how to do that companion crop uh, in, a, in a less competitive water way. And so I don't know how that could work, I would think it would be fun to try a, a rototiller. That's what the University of Minnesota did with their Cura Clover, is they took a three-point rotary tiller and just removed all the tines, except on a 30-inch spacing, they just left a couple tines. And that way you could just turn up a nice, a nice strip for going into a living cover system. And I like that, and I'd like to emulate that and, and see how well I can get it to work up here. Um, so we, we talked to insurance and we're like, hey, there's, there's a lot of the field here that, that is not going to make it. You can see that it's a zero crop. I mean, the corn is, is knee high. It, it, it's a zero crop there. And like literally zero. And so what we did was uh, talk to the insurance and, and ask them what, what our options are. And he says, because of my insurance policy that I have, the, the design of it, is go ahead and cut as much as you feel you need to cut leave some strips and so i left i left anything on the the edges the headland and the other edge that looks like it could make a viable ear so anything that looked like you know 40 percent or better of a corn crop stayed as a corn crop and so it's just this channel up here and this this headland is the only thing that got cut and you can already see how awesome it's only been cut for a couple days uh i i left it out here to taunt taunt god to bring us more rain and it worked it worked um but you can already see 
in a matter of days how green that alfalfa how green that alfalfa is and how well it's responding to this rain and uh, and so it, it this year proved what a valuable testament to, or a, a valuable powerful crop alfalfa can be and why a guy should always keep some alfalfa in the mixes because even on a hard drought year you're gonna get something we're going to see if I can do this one-handed so you can kind of see how this little scraper works. I got my button set up so the top button brings the pan forward to eject the dirt and the bottom one retracts the pan. I push the joystick forward to float because it's just a one-way cylinder up top. And I just let it kind of touch off up here and I'll, I'll slow way down here. Um, Well, it just kind of catches and then at some point here I lock the hydraulic so it don't just sink out of sight it fills up and you let it kind of boil and now I start lifting and closing the gate And uh, you can see clay at the back of our strip. And then, uh, so all we got to do is just get to the clay. Um, we're not trying to cut an elevation. We just got to get the clay. So when I'm here, I open that gate and start bringing the pusher forward. And I got my cutting edge low. So it doesn't just create a big old mound. And uh, and that's pretty much it. Now I'm running the gate back. Bring him down a little bit. And that's pretty much it. And then I, I just hold my handle forward and we we zip around for another another go and uh, so we got clay up here but not back there so we're gonna kind of drive down into the grade and then set the pan down on that clay and then drive out and just kind of clean that up a little bit and so pretty well, we got a chunk in the middle here we can clean up and um, just go around and around.
So I showed you how I'm using that joystick in the cab to run the scraper. And it's so nice because I just bump my T-handle. I get my transmission or my ground speed set. And then I just have my hand running the scraper. And, uh, and then when I go up the pile, so my hand doesn't, from the time I'm doing the cut of filling the scraper and come out of the shop and go over the pile and empty the scraper, my hand never leaves that joystick. It's just so convenient. You're not trying to remember index finger for this, middle finger, you know, like on a normal uh, right-hand arm console. And, and you're not jumping from lever to lever like I would with the 46. And, and so I got the hydraulic rate. So the pan, if you when you look close at the pan, it's a one-way cylinder. It's an old cable scraper that somebody converted to hydraulics. There's a one-way cylinder up there. So while you're cutting, if you click down, which there's no hydraulic pressure going down, the pan will still go very quickly. So I have the hydraulics set very slow, so it, it lifts slow and sets slow, but that gives me good control when I'm in the grade for finishing up and trying to just to shave off the black dirt from the clay. And, and then with your thumb toggling the two buttons to eject and, and retract the injection door. Uh, what Dad is working on over there is there used to be his grandma's chicken coop used to be right there, and there was a water line that came in there. Um, so that for the foundation of that chicken coop, they used field stone and concrete or, or uh, cement mix and field stone. And, and so you can see the big chunks of concrete in there. And um, so he's getting that out of the way because we didn't want any of that stuff messing around or causing issues with the scraper pan. And then... I'll build up, I'll eject a bunch of loads up there, and then he zips over there, kind of smooths it off, pushes some dirt up the hill so I can keep on going. But, yep, then on the back side of the pile, I take my hand off the joystick, and I run the T-handle coming up the drive. So I just hold the T-handle forward or pump it like a power shift and just zip up the drive. Whoa, there we're taking off. I mean, this, this tractor and transmission, I, I, I'm sold. I am absolutely sold. I mean, look at you, you're going 15 miles an hour and 80 feet. I mean, it's just, it, I am 100% glad I got talked into getting this tractor because I was going for a John Deere and the salesman said, nope, you're, I, I will sell you on this Massey. And we kind of chuckled, but. I got it. He sure did. But he spent three hours with me uh, trying to show me why I should get it. And he wasn't lying. So far, everything I've asked the tractor to do, it has done it very well and efficiently. Uh, I have yet to see a tank, get a tank of fuel go much more than four gallons an hour. I mean, this, this tractor just does not use fuel. Uh, the whole time doing the scraper stuff, the engine, I have the throttle set at 1,200, but the whole time I'm scraping, it barely goes over 1,200. The only time it revs up is when I mash the T-handle back there, or if you jerk the T-handle back, it, it engine brakes to try and slow the transmission. And so, yeah, man, I, I, I got to tell you, it's, it's kind of funny because you wonder how on earth it can be that efficient because when you're going down the road, most of the time going down the road, it's at five, six miles, gallons an hour. You hit a little hill, it's at 12, 13 gallons an hour. But at the same time, when you're bailing, uh, it's at three, three and a half the whole time you're around bailing. I mean, it just does not use fuel. And the fact that, yep, it may be using 13 gallons an hour on the road, but it's, you know, 30 to 50% faster on the road than the other tractors. And so... Yeah, I, I, I'm 100% happy so far with this purchase. Uh, in fact, this spring, uh, I don't know where I would be if I had still been using the 4640. I think I would have been in trouble a lot of times. Um, but you can see behind that scraper pan, look how hard that is. And so we got that yellow clay. We'll take a look at that yellow clay, but that's what's under all our fields. You know, we only got nine inches of topsoil. We'll take a look at that.
dead, he's going to start bucketing then that rubble pile with all the concrete in over to our, our spoil pile there. And then that white pile, that's 400 tons of crushed concrete that's going to be our subgrade. And if we need a few more truckloads to finish it off, then that's what we're going to do. Um, we got to get our string lines set and the string will be top of concrete elevation and the string line will we'll set it like at a five foot larger than what the shop is going to be so we got room to work around inside it if we need to we're right by dad's left is where the sanitary tank is going to go uh and the drone is going home you see the lagoon over there uh so I launched the drone from the back of the truck. The battery is now low, so it is taking itself home um, to land. So it's doing it all on its own. I'm I'm in the tractor driving. <laughs> so it's pretty cool how it does that on its own. And it'll land right on the back of the truck. Ooh, there's... Don't scratch my paint. Don't scratch my paint. There's the controller laying on the truck. There's its safety case. And it, I don't know, it's hard for you guys to see, but it was extremely windy today. And so there you go. Well, thank you very much.